Welcome to Within the Frame. I'm Han Daen, coming to you live from Seoul. The global space race is heating up with countries like the U.S. and China spearheading fresh space initiatives. South Korea is also sparing no efforts to become a major space powerhouse, doubling its space budget and enhancing public-private partnerships in the new space era. For a comprehensive examination of the latest developments in space news, we're joined by Shin Dong-hyuk, assistant professor at the Department of Aerospace engineering at KAIST. So great to have you with us. Uh, hello. We're also delighted to have Wendy Whitman Cobb, Professor of Strategy and Security Studies at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. Welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Professor Whippenkopf, let's start with you. Elon Musk's SpaceX launched its powerful Starship for the third time into space earlier this month. Uh, but before we get into the details of the latest launch, first give us an introduction to the massive rocket. It really is a very impressive rocket. Uh, it is SpaceX's uh, ne next uh, designed rocket and vehicle that is designed to do a lot of different things. Ultimately, SpaceX would like this uh, heavy lift rocket to take uh, it and its paying customers to Mars. But in the meantime, it will serve uh, as a means to get to the moon, uh, as well as part of the human landing system on the moon for NASA's Artemis program. Uh, and it's really able to do this because it is a, a massive rocket with massive lifting power, more powerful than the Saturn V rocket that took the United States to the moon in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, it's two stages. Uh, both are designed to be fully reusable, which would be a first. Uh, even SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket now is only partially reusable, recovering the first stage and uh, reusing it time after time. I think the most uh, flown booster is up to 19 times at this point. Um, so this really would be a massive uh, shift in what we've been doing with space technology because up to this point, most of our rockets have been expendable, single use, and that drives up costs. So between SpaceX really reducing cost in, in being able to reuse uh, these rockets coming up and in increasing the lifting power, we're really in store for a lot of changes, I think, in the next couple of years in terms of how much we have going to space and how much we can do there. Well, uh, I hear that Starship is as tall as a 16-story building. It's by far the largest and the most powerful rocket the world has ever built. There's no argument about that. Uh, Dr. Shin, uh, the Starship rocket reached new heights in its monumental third test flight, but was lost on re-entry. What's your assessment of the third launch? So even though it was it failed, I mean it didn't complete everything what they designed, but still they uh, provide a very uh, a very impressive improvement. So during the last uh, two flight tests, actually the first state engine exploded, but this time the first state engine worked much better, and then or uh, 33 left engine was uh, boosted, and then the second stage reached a targeted 260 kilometer altitude. And then uh, after the uh, engine gets separated, so it did uh, kind of the first stage engine did a uh, fleet maneuver and then boost back and then landing bun. But uh, when they did a landing bun, they didn't uh, ignite the old engines. So it had some partial fail um, in, in terms of the first stage engine. When it comes to the second stage engine, so it reached a targeted 260 altitude. And then uh, at that altitude, they conducted the multiple test case. One is the propellant transfer and then opening and closing of the, of the door. And then after that, they uh, tried to land. And, but on the re-entry, so uh, if we land from the space, so the speed become accelerated. And then also we are able to see some plasma uh, or surrounding the, the vehicle. And then there is some communication disconnected due to the plasma. So uh, a communication disconnection is quite common when the vehicle is uh, entering into the uh, atmosphere. But if it is, if it were able to survive, then we should be able to communicate again. But it turned out we, uh, the space could not reach the vehicle again. So we assume it's burned in, in the air. So uh, they plan to have uh, three more tests in this year. So. I'm sure they will fix all these issues so that we'll able to see some 
good uh, lending bond and then being able to survive uh, on, on the re-entry. Uh, space experts say that one of the key takeaways from the third launch uh, was, was the, that it was the longest uh, test flight uh, done by SpaceX. It traveled halfway around the Earth, also uh, reaching the targeted orbital speed. Uh, and so although the rocket uh, didn't survive re-entry, uh, it marks a huge stride towards SpaceX's uh, next step. And as you've pointed out, it plans to carry out three more uh, test launches this year and another the next launch is expected to come as early as this may so we'll have to keep ta uh, closed tabs on that and dr whitman cobb the race to the moon is intensifying with a huge wave of attention drawn to which billionaire will get there first elon musk or jeff bezos what are your expectations if i had to, to place a bet at this point in time i think it will be elon musk spacex uh blue origin jeff bezos's company is certainly improving. Uh, they are getting ready to carry out some tests on its New Glenn, uh, New Glenn rocket, uh, which will be their very first orbital rocket. Uh, to this point, Blue Origin has only accomplished suborbital flights, uh, which is which is great because they can re they've demonstrated reusability in their launch technology, but they've yet to get to orbit. Uh, so I think Blue Origin still has quite a ways to go. That being said, they do have very expansive plans and also plan to uh, to uh, go to the moon with on on its own and with NASA's Artemis program. Uh, so I think they will they will probably both likely get there. Uh, however, I think uh, at this point, SpaceX really does have a large head start uh, in terms of the technology and where they're at in their testing. I, I think we're expecting a first test launch of the new Glenn rocket for Blue Origin sometime this year. Uh, so I think, I still think the money is on SpaceX though. Uh, we recently heard that Jeff Bezos uh, once again dethroned Elon Musk as the richest man on Earth, uh, according to Forbes, that is. But um, your projection is that Elon Musk will probably get to the moon first. Uh, now, Dr. Shin, private space companies' lunar exploration projects are in full swing across the globe. Tell us a little bit about the significance of the private sector's active participation in the new space era. So we've been keep saying about the new space and then uh, so far we only listed SpaceX and the Starlink. And then nowadays, uh, you, now you are seeing here more about more different private company. And then one uh, example is something called the uh, intuitive machines. So uh, uh, this month, all, early this year, so uh, a new lunar lander, this is the first time uh, a private company is pro producing lunar lander called the Odysseus is able to land softly on the lunar surface. Uh, it's not a hundred percent success because it landed, but it's been tilted a little bit, but it still be able to produce and send the image, lunar surface image back to Earth. And then later uh, this year, uh, another company called uh, Astra Botics uh, will uh, send uh, uh, another private uh, lunar explorer to Moon. So we will see a lot of the activity uh, produced by a private company. So in Korea, there is also interesting uh, activity going on. So uh, do you know some, called, some company called, called Borium? It's a pharmaceutical company. So actually, they are interested in space. So they uh, made a joint venture with the Axiom to establish a space station. And then they potentially put produce the drug which is without gravity. So it's an interesting development. Also inside the Korea, there is a one more uh, small satellite uh, developer. So previously it was uh, there, there, there were in you know, space and then Perigee. Now there's uh, one more competitor called the Una Stella. So uh, as time goes, so we have a more company is participating in this uh, space uh, race. So it's really exciting to see all these companies from big companies to startups and even the small companies, uh, you know, actively engaging in the development of Korea's space industry. And as you uh, highlighted, Poryong, the pharmaceutical company, its uh, joint venture projects with Axiom is actually very creative. Uh, and it's really interesting to watch developments on that front as well. Uh, Dr. Whitman Cobb, China, meanwhile, has launched its Chue Chiao 2 relay satellite to support the country's 
upcoming lunar far side and south polar missions. Tell us more about this and also bring us up to date on China's lunar exploration. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of countries and companies really do have some pretty expansive plans to explore the moon. Uh, in this case, this recent launch was for a, sat a satellite designed to help China communicate with, with its future uh, lunar missions. Uh, because the moon is tidally locked with the Earth and one side all, uh, ever only ever faces the Earth, they cannot use line of sight communications if they intend to land on the far side of the moon. Um, and certainly additional communications relays would be helpful uh, for landings at the South Pole. Uh, so this is following uh, along a, a following in the path of a previous communication satellite. China has plans for several others, uh, all designed to further their lunar exploration plans as we move on, uh, especially following up on uh, its previous lunar missions. The new ones that they're planning, uh, one of the really intriguing things that they are planning on doing is a soil sample return, uh, being able to get a soil sample once you're on the moon and then be able to return it to Earth. Uh, this is certainly a, you know, a difficult thing to do. And so I think that's really going to show us a lot of where uh, China's space ambitions and abilities really lie. Uh, so I think it's a really fun, fun and exciting time to see just what will come of all of these projects going to the moon and, and what research and benefits we get from it. Chue uh, Tiao, I hear, uh, translates into Magpie Bridge in English. And like the name suggests, it's designed to facilitate communication uh, for China's lunar probe mission, uh, which you've explained, uh, which is to aiming to retrieve samples uh, from the moon's hidden side for the first time. If successful, it'll be a mega feat for the for China as a country, but uh, it'll be such an interesting, uh, uh, an inspiring and, and, uh, and interesting, uh, it just, it's so exciting feat uh, for all of the space enthusiasts across the globe. Now, Professor Shin, Hanhua Aerospace, often referred to as the Korean version of SpaceX, has been selected to lead Korea's next Next generation space launch vehicle project along with the state-run Korea Aerospace Research Institute. Could you give us the details of the project and what are your prospects for the public-private collaboration? So right now there are two major uh, government-funded space launcher development and then it turned out that both of them uh, has a partner with uh, HANA. So uh, I think it will produce a strong synergy between Kari and then HANA Aerospace. The new project which, uh, aims to upgrade Nurio. So in terms of capacity, Nurio, actually Nurio is designed to put 1.5 tons of satellite into uh, 700 kilometer orbit. Uh, that should be practical, for example, Starlink satellite weigh around 260 kilogram, so that uh, it can do conduct a uh, kind of practical um, delivery. However, Nurio still have a lot of room to improve. The first one is to increase capacity. So in the upgraded project, they aim to develop 100 ton engines to be able to send seven tons of satellite to 500 kilometer orbit, which will be 4.5 times increased. Also aim able to send 1.8 tons of satellite to moon. So the plan is to be able to send our lunar explorer uh, by our uh, space launcher. Secondly, the engine will be uh, become more multifunctioning. So Nurio's engine can only ignite once. So this brings a severe drawback when it comes to uh, reusability and orbit transfer. For example, if the first stage engine land on Earth, you need to uh, ignite the engine again to slow down the to, to slow down the speed, and then when you move to when you go to Moon, actually you need to do something called the uh, uh, orbit transfer because you are circling around the earth for some time and then you ignite you push yourself a little bit to change the orbit so this is called the or orbit transfer and for this one you know, the engine should be able to do multiple ignition, uh, multiple ignition and then all of these are uh, kind of under development with this new project so uh i hope that uh, this project is very successful and then uh, um the Sahana will be very competitive in terms of cost and then also has a large capacity to explore to Moon and, and to Mars in the future. 
Uh, Hanwha Aerospace will take uh, will take part uh, in the entire process from planning to launch operations, uh, which really will be a symbolic step in ushering in uh, a new space era led by the private sector. So we're pinning high hopes on that. And staying with you, Dr. Chin, the Yoon administration plans to inject 1.5 trillion won during President Yoon's term and induce 100 trillion won investment by 2045 to turn South Korea into a major space powerhouse. Could you elaborate on the efforts being made by the government uh, and also how do you assess them? So I believe this is a very timely investment from the government. So uh, Korea, we've been stream strong in semiconductor, automobile and ship manufacturing. However, we, constant, we constantly uh, are challenged by other competitors and then it is time to di diversify our industry. So far, uh, the Korean space development has been conducted in three different locations. One is Gohung, Sacheon, and Daejeon. So actually, uh, the government decided to kind of uh, focusing on these three areas. So Gohung is uh, it's widely known for the location for space uh, where Nurio is launched. So the government will uh, invest establish a national industrial complex where all the relevant parts are manufactured in on site. And then secondly, uh, Sacheon and Jinju, where large satellite uh, companies are located. And then they will uh, uh, establish a satellite innovation research center. And then also in Jinju, they will put the space envir uh, environment test facility, which will be very expensive. And then uh, a single company cannot afford to do it by themselves. And also in Sacheon, I think some of you, you know that uh, the new administration called the uh, Korea Aerospace Administration, or in Korean, Uju Hangongjong, will be established over there. So there will be another focal point in terms of space. So lastly, Daejeon, where actually where I live, actually will focus on education. So space has been a showcase for uh, many countries for science advancement, but now it's time to uh, change the paradigm. So it will be a place where money will be made, and then uh, I hope the our country will be competitive in the market and then uh, this investment will uh, i mean will make a good path to to the future well, South Korea, after becoming the seventh in the world to launch a homegrown space rocket, is now vying to become one of the five major space powerhouses. And hopefully that goal can be attained through uh, active participation from the private sector, uh, uh, along with uh, the government's continual support. And last question for you, uh, Dr. Whitman Cobb. The global race to the moon is heating up. Why is lunar exploration so important for many countries? Yeah, I think there's a, a mix of reasons uh, for countries specifically. A lot of lunar exploration is driven by international prestige and reputation and the search for, for political power uh, on the world stage. Uh, it's been that way since the Cold War uh, when we had the Soviet Union and the United States racing to get to the moon. So for a lot of countries, it, it's about sort of that search for prestige. That's not to say that there aren't other motivations, because clearly there are some economic considerations to be made here in terms of what kind of market can be opened up in terms of lunar exploration and the types of resources we may be able to get from the moon. Uh, and so for a lot of private companies that are also participating in this race, I think a lot of their drive is for that uh, coming market and seeing where that goes in the future, because right now, we really don't know a lot about what resources are on the moon. We have guesses as to what's there and what may be there, but we need to get actually get there and have a sustained human presence all, over a long period of time to really find that out and to really suss out what kinds of economic opportunities there will be. And, and of course, this is always about scientific uh, knowledge and exploration as well. Uh, the moon is our closest neighbor and it can tell us a lot about Earth origins uh, in the solar system and a lot about uh, the space around us and what's out there. So I think there's a lot of overlapping interests here that can only be served by working together. 
So finding more about the moon and establishing sustainable human presence there will definitely be worth the astronomical amount of money and time being put in into so many uh, space projects across the globe. Thank you so much, Dr. Whipton Cobb, for uh, joining us despite the harsh time difference. And also many thanks to you, Dr. Shin, for sharing your valuable insights. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back with more same time next week. See you then.